Hello, this is Madeline. Today we're going to talk about ultrasound guided thoracentesis. So our learning objectives are to describe the benefits of using ultrasound for thoracentesis and also describe the procedure of using ultrasound for guidance. As with many procedures, use of ultrasound helps make thoracentesis safer. Knowledge of the surrounding structures is critical to all procedures, but with thoracentesis, the ultrasound can help you know whether the fluid you're seeing is large enough to be drained by a needle or should be left alone. It also makes the diagnosis of other abnormalities that may mimic an infusion, such as atelectasis, a consolidation, or elevated hemidiaphragm. This helps you avoid complications. Ultrasound has been shown to reduce the complications associated with thoracentesis from about 4 to 30 percent, depending on the literature you read, down to about 1.3 percent. And truly, if you do this procedure and are careful with the ultrasound, it should be down around 0 percent. For this ultrasound technique, we can choose a wide variety of probes. The most common to use is the linear probe because it will give you a better detail of the needle. This is what we use for real-time ultrasound guidance if we're doing the procedure. If you use an ultrasound for needle localization, then either the curvilinear or the phased array transducer is appropriate. However, if you're going to do real-time needle guidance, these transducers will not be able to visualize the needle as well as the linear probe. For ultrasound of the chest, generally we place the probe across the ribs. When we do this, we see the rib and cross section, and we see the pleura just below it. In a breathing patient, the pleura actually moves. It moves one against each other so it looks like there are ants marching up and down a hill, or, in other words, the sliding long sign. This tells you that there is not air between the two pleural surfaces. This is a good indication that there is not a pneumothorax, at least a not a pneumothorax at the position you're looking at with the ultrasound. Here's a close-up example. Here we can see the pleural surface and they're moving relative to one another. While the patient breathes, the visceral pleura is sliding against the parietal pleura and it causes this sliding motion, also known as the sliding long sign. In the picture on the left, we have our transducer placed over normal long. There is no pneumothorax, so the two pleura are one against each other, and we can see that as the sliding long sign on the left. The right picture, our transducer is over a pneumothorax, so we can see the parietal pleura, but we can't see the visceral pleura. The reason is, is that we can't see through an air interface such as the pneumothorax, and we do not see this sliding long sign between the two pleura. What we're really looking for, though, is not a pneumothorax, but a pleural effusion. And ultrasound is very good at picking up pleural effusions, as little as 100 milliliters of fluid. Generally, pleural effusions will collect in the dependent portion of the chest, that means down near the diaphragm, if the patient is sitting upright, or towards the back if they're laying flat. Pleural effusions are made of fluid, so they generally are black or anechoic, certainly hypoechoic, and they outline the other structures such as the diaphragm, pleura against the chest wall, and the lung. You will often visualize the lung floating in the fluid. Here we see compressive atelectasis as the fluid has compressed the air out of the lungs and now you can see the lungs. Don't be alarmed by this. This is a normal finding in pleural effusion. You cannot always tell if a pleural effusion is complex, meaning an exudative process, or simple, as in a transitative process. If you see substances floating in the fluid, as on the picture on the right, you know that this is an exudative process. The picture on the left is anechoic fluid, and you cannot tell just by the ultrasound whether this is a transidate or an exudate. The only way you know this is to actually stick a needle into the fluid, draw some out, and test it. The technique for doing this, ultrasound guided thoracentesis, requires a cooperative patient. Generally, the way I do this technique is I look for pleural effusions with the patient in the semi-erect or lying down position and then sit them up to do the thoracentesis. If you're looking for free fluid, that is a good way to do this. But if you're looking for a pneumothorax, the patient has to be completely supine, laying on their back, with you looking for a pneumothorax on the anterior chest wall. We have other lectures dedicated to this, so I'm going to bypass this for now, but just remember it's a different position if you're looking for a pneumothorax. Again, I generally start with the patient in the recumbent position, and I scan from their side. I am going to look for something I know, which is generally the spleen or the liver, the kidney, and then the diaphragm should be superior to that. If I see black fluid above the diaphragm, then I know that they have a pleural effusion. Once I've made the diagnosis of pleural effusion, I generally sit patients up and scan from the back. Evaluation posteriorly helps you determine the size of the pneumothorax. You can use 
the markers on the ultrasound to tell you the distance from the parietal pleura all the way down to the lungs. This helps you know whether you can safely stick a needle in the pleural effusion without touching the lungs. The procedure for ultrasound guided thoracentesis is almost the same as in non-ultrasound guided thoracentesis. The indications and equipment setup are exactly the same. However, since this is a sterile technique and now we're using an ultrasound transducer, we're going to use an a sterile ultrasound sheath as well as sterile ultrasound gel. There are two methods of doing this procedure. One way is ultrasound localization, where you use the ultrasound to locate the largest pocket of fluid and mark the site for a blind insertion of the needle. The other way is actually use an ultrasound to guide the needle into the fluid. Ultrasound guidance for thoracentesis adds very little benefit and complicates the procedure in that it is very difficult to see the needle in the chest underneath the linear transducer. We're going to cover ultrasound localization. There are two ways you can do a thoracentesis, either when the patient is semi-recumbent, laying down, or if they're sitting up. A lot of this depends on your condition of your patient. For the semi-erect position, the pleural effusion is going to be dependent, so you're going to look for the diaphragm. It's very important to visualize the diaphragm because you do not want to stick your needle through the diaphragm while you're trying to do a thoracentesis. Once you identify the diaphragm, you can mark your site of entry of your needle. You want to make sure that you take into account that the patient's breathing and as you decrease the amount of fluid in the chest, the diaphragm may rise. Therefore, make sure your needle is far enough away from the diaphragm that it will not interfere with this. The posterior approach, you have a lot more safety in my opinion because you can see the depth of the fluid you can tell how far your needle can go in before it hits the lungs, and I call this your safe zone. So you can use ultrasound to define what your safe zone is and know that your needle will not touch the lungs even as you draw out fluid. The posterior approach is the most common method of doing thoracentesis. So using ultrasound in the posterior approach makes the most sense because most clinicians are used to doing this method. Now this was a brief overview of how to use ultrasound for thoracentesis. Make sure you follow standard procedure processes including sterile fields and avoid the neurovascular bundle as you would in a blind thoracentesis. Choose your position whether it's semi-recumbent or laying flat and a lot of this will depend on your patient's condition. Make sure you identify and correctly diagnose a pleural effusion using the ultrasound then determine its size and depth. Make sure you know what those surrounding structures are particularly the diaphragm. And then after you get done with the thoracentesis, you can reassess your patient to see how well you drain the fluid, how much is left, as well as evaluate for pneumothorax. Thank you very much.